back, way back, way back, way back, way back. Then. There was a group called Johnny Kidd and the Pirates. Well, you move it right up close to me. I mean, no one was doing what, what, what he was doing. I mean, it was just so different, so different. I saw him live in Belfast, Romano's Ballroom in Belfast. There was about, there was about half a dozen people there, and I was one of them, you know? Um, but he still, they still put on a show, and uh, as far as like movement goes, I mean, the, the, it, it makes people like today seem like they're standing still. Shaking all over top the charts in 1960 for Johnny Kidd and the Pirates. Plenty of covers bear testimony to the song's lasting quality, including the late Vince Taylor's. Sending shivers down the backbone, it's belted out in stadiums and theatres across the world. Johnny Kidd's backing group, the Pirates, still perform it today. I don't think there was a band in the country that didn't do Shaking Around Shaking Around Although he wrote it, he never sought the credit he deserved. He had other hits, and his bands launched the careers of some of rock's greatest musicians. Hendrix, Zeppelin, Deep Purple, The Who, as well as punks and today's metal bands, all owe him a debt. Johnny was born Freddie Heath in Wilsdon, North London. His dream was always to be a rock star, and as soon as his national service was over, he formed the Five Nutter Skiffle Group. He was a natural performer, and the wild sounds of rock and roll attracted his eccentric personality. Revisiting the streets where they first met, Pete Newman remembers how his new sax first caught Johnny's attention. I was about 17 then. When I got this knock at the door, I saw this guy confronting me and I thought, that's that tramp who was outside the pub at the White Halls playing for pennies. I remember this guy with an old Spanish guitar, an army great coat, sitting on the floor with a hat. I say basically call them buskers these days. And he was playing for pennies, that was it. And of course, the next time he knocked on my door saying, I heard you playing saxophone. And I said, I don't play the saxophone, I'm just trying to practice, you know. He said, look, I've got this new band just down the road here at the local pub. We've seen all these films with Little Richard and everything else. And he said, we just got to have a saxophone in the band. And I said, well, I can't play. He said, no, it doesn't matter. Just swing the thing around. As uh, long as it looks good. Freddie was so poor at one time. His socks were so worn out, they had no bottoms to them. This is absolutely gospel truth. He was a bit of a laugh, he was a bit of a eccentric too. He only had the top halves of his sock. And he tucked them in his shoes. Of course, when he walked along, you could see the white of his ankle as his foot moved up, you see, when it rode up. So what he did, he got my mum to get this thing that we used to call blacking, to paint his bottom of his feet black. Tuck his sock into the top of his shoe. <laughs> so that when he walked along the road and the sock came up, nobody sussed that he didn't have any socks on. With or without socks, Freddie Heath took his new mate Pete Newman to the Met in Edgware Road to see Wee Willie Harris perform. With a lucky Johnny Boogie's eye. When you hold my hand on my prehistoric man. <laughs> What was happening on the stage, not the material, was what Johnny Kidd wanted to do. In other words, he wanted to create a bit of a spectacle. If there's anybody that's feeling bad, whoever come along with me. Freddie Heath's rock and roll band served their time playing at local pubs and ballrooms. Their first single was soon on the jukeboxes and on BBC Radio Saturday Club. Your record, by the way, of which that's one side, made the charts last week, didn't it? Yes, that's right. It came in where? At number 20. Well, that's good going. 
Johnny Kidd and the Pirates, with their record success, Please Don't Touch. <laughs> The actual band went to Abbey Road Studios as Freddie Heath and the Rock and Roll Combo and came out of the studios at that recording session as Johnny Kidd and the Pirates. And I think there was a coffee break or something or other. And recall vaguely coming back and on one of these sort of director's chairs was this note saying, Johnny Kidd. The reason for the patch has been the subject of much speculation. His eye had been damaged as a boy and now he'd adopted the name Johnny Kidd the patch was the ideal way of covering it. When the first record charted, his original band were reluctant to give up the day jobs and go on tour. Rock and roll seemed like a passing fad. New pirates were enlisted. Johnny kept Alan Caddy, the lead guitarist, and hired an experienced duo who had worked with Billy Fury and Terry Dean. The drummer was Clem Catini. <laughs> We were originally a four-piece, uh, but we'd rehearsed, and the rhythm guitar player's wife then decided she didn't want him to go on the road. So he dropped out, and we carried on as a trio. And that's basically how the trio started. Brian Gregg was the hard-working bass player. I was doubling up. I was doing sort of lots of notes, and Alan had this style where he played rhythm and lead, a chunky, you know, to fill in the holes. It was cheaper touring with the trio, but they still made a big noise, inspiring other groups to think small. It was a, a totally different sound to what they were doing, and we often had them standing on the side of the stage watching us, wondering how the hell we got this sound with just three of us. And I remember touring up north, and there was a band on the bill called the Dolphins. They later became the Hollies, and they were big fans of us. And they told me that they, they wouldn't allow Graham Nash to plug in because they were trying to get the same sound as we had. I don't want you to be no slave. Most of the stuff was rhythm and blues or blues or Tamil Motown. So Johnny had his own direction that he wanted to go in because of his voice. He had a great voice. I just want to make love to you, love to you. Etta James, people like that Johnny liked. In fact, he covered an Etta James song, yeah? um, I Just Want to Make Love to You. All I want to do... Now, this is 59, 60. Most of the sort of, uh, if you like, the groups, like the Stones and the Beatles, I mean, they weren't even thought of at the time, you know? There is nothing for... I think John was a cult figure. And I think wherever we played, I think we always used to pull a crowd because it was Johnny Kidd. The group hit the jackpot with the recording of their third single, Shaking All Over. The old standard, Yes Sir, That's My Baby, was intended as the A-side. Shaking came about by accident on the eve of the recording when Johnny and the boys met at the Skiffle Cellar, run by Chas McDevitt. And they suddenly realised they hadn't got a B-side. So he and Brian Gregg, I don't know if there was anybody else there, went down into the basement and sat on the old Coca-Cola crates and broken doors and wrote this shaking all over. They didn't have a guitar, they just wrote it. And next day they recorded it, and it became the A-side. One of the best English rock and roll records I think there ever were. Johnny had the title, shaking all over, because of this shake routine thing. And nobody was into it, as I said. He came out with, when you're moving right up close to me, and then someone else would say, that's when I get the shakes, or, and we were all slotting in lyrics. We all worked on it, we all did like, work to put our penneth in, which you did in those days, you know, you rehearse something and I played this there and Alan would play something else and, and Brian would play the figures that he played and that's how things evolved in those days. I mean, you made your own arrangements up on the spot. You didn't sort of, I mean, none of us could read anyway. You know, I didn't know there was being a crotchet and hatchet in them days. Johnny had gone home the night before, or after we'd finished at the freight train, and put some order to it, a couple of verses. Anyway, we recorded it and we were a bit embarrassed about it because we didn't really have any feel for it. it was, we hadn't done the song. And they shouted through from the box, it's OK, but... And we thought, oh, here we go. They said, it's not long enough for jukeboxes. If it was too short, 
that was not, and if it was too long, the needle would come off before the song finished. So it had to be within two and a half minutes or something. So Clem Catini suggested he put a drum solo in the middle of it to lengthen it. And I made a goof up. I, I miscounted. Instead of doing one bar, I did two, and that's how the, the drum solo came out of it. And Peter Sullivan said, oh, no, keep it in. He said, that could be a nice trademark. And I kept it in. That's now it's a history. We were just amazed at the way it took off. And now they're, t they're calling it a British classic, you know. After that, we decided we're songwriters, and the three of us got together a few times and, to write a song. And we just couldn't do it. It just didn't come off because we were trying. With this thing, we just literally threw it away. We just said, OK, and bung the lyrics in, and everybody was tired, and we went home. The first gig we did after Shaking Oliver got to number one, we were working at High Wickham, I always remember it. They were selling the tickets on the black market outside to get into the hall to see Johnny Kidd. And the guy was so pleased because he'd sold out. I mean, he got us for about 50 quid, I think, at the time. And he was so pleased, he gave us a fiver extra, a pound each. Well, John took two and we took a pound each. <laughs> so, as, as a thank you for pulling the punters. Johnny, we have one more request for you to read. It says, Dear Brian, Will you please play Johnny Kidd and the Pirates record of Restless for my boyfriend? She lives... And there's some kisses there for you, Brian. Uh, oh, that, uh, no, they're for you, I'm sure. <laughs> no, but anyway, you. here for Sheila and a boyfriend is Johnny singing Restless. You don't know how restless you may Despite the phenomenal success of Shaking All Over, the follow-up Restless failed miserably, only scraping into the top 20, and their work became more erratic. And the tours were planned so badly, some of them. I mean, you'd be playing in Newcastle one day, and the next day you're in Plymouth. So it meant when you finished the gig in Newcastle, you had to travel all night. I fell asleep in the middle of a Johnny Kidd act. Can you believe that? I, I came to as I was falling over. We stopped at a transport cafe. And John decided to put the whole of the night's takings into, the, into a fruit machine. And remember, I'm talking about six mini pieces. So we were there for about four hours, five hours, while John was playing these fruit machines. Plus, he used to like go to the dogs. I mean, the times he'd pick up the money from a gig and then go off to the dogs and lose it all, it, was, it happened so many times. But that was John, you know. We never got a situation where we never got paid. Johnny's casual attitude and a management more used to handling variety acts and comedians failed to push Kid, and future success looked bleak. Our manager at the time was Stanley Dale, who used to manage Tony Hancock. They, if they could have got John into the situation of, you know, like, oh, get him on telly, get him doing this, get him doing that, and, and make it, get him, getting an image for him, you know, like, uh, uh, maybe it, gone, it, it would have gone on better. He had an image of a failed pop star. Their heyday over, the Pirates jumped ship, creating the Tornadoes. A year later, they scored a worldwide hit record, Telstar. I went to see him at Sutton Granada with Frank, our drummer, and we sat up in the balcony watching the act. And at the end of it, we looked at each other and said, wouldn't that be great to be doing that with him? And about two months later, we were. Though his records weren't hits, Johnny's stage show still attracted young musicians, and it wasn't long before a new crew of pirates were press ganged, including drummer Frank Fairley and ace guitarist Mick Green, whose present day pirates still perform all over the world, with bass player Johnny Spence taking over kids' vocals. After just three days' rehearsal, the new pirates were on the road. This time, supporting American rocker Jerry Lee Lewis. And Kid said, well, uh, hello, Jerry. So I'm Johnny Kidd, this is my guitarist, Mickey Green. Um, I just want to know if you're going to do what I say, because if you're doing it, we won't do it. And we're just staring at you. He goes, um, well, Johnny Kidd, we get out there, we mess around a little, and then you got something. And that was his answer. So we just sort of didn't know what he was talking about. Turned round, kid hit me up the rear end with a sword as we turned round. He must look like Laurel and Hardy walking out of the place. And I got out, so I said to the kid, well, what does that mean? The kid said, well, that means we're doing it. Come on. 
Come on, sugar, tell me. Tell me, tell me, what are you gonna do? Yeah. Although on the road with Mick Green and the other pirates, Johnny found time for a blind date with 19-year-old hairdresser Jean Complin. She wasn't attracted by his fame or money. Both had faded, but they were soon living together. He was working, and, um, and I went with them. The four of us went in the car, and the group had obviously gone in the van. And, uh, and you know, I mean, he was only on stage for a couple of hours, and, uh, and then it, you know, just turned into a sort of just an ordinary, sociable date. He wasn't well off then. It, the, the record had been a long way back, and he hadn't had another hit at the time. He was a little bit struggling. There hadn't been any hits. And then, us being younger musicians, we sort of had the feel of what was beginning to happen with the Liverpool thing. Young and enthusiastic, his new musicians led Johnny in a new direction, away from pure rock and blues and into more of the group sound. He did shot of rhythm and blues, which was his first thing that went into the sort of top faulty, I mean, which we instigated, really. With another hit record, Johnny was back on the road again. I mean, he hadn't won anything up as far as the blue boar. After that, you were in Indian country. We used to leave about 2 o'clock in the morning to go to Liverpool because we had a, a lunchtime do there at the cavern. We had to, we had to be ready to play at 12 o'clock. Stopping the transport cuffs all the way. And then when we got to Liverpool, we had to find a hotel to stay in and then go and do the gig. So it was a right protracted affair to do a, to do a one-off, certainly at lunchtime. Well, nothing's tough when you're 17, is it? I mean, what's tough? It's all a laugh, it's a big joke. I can't tell the way you look at me The way you smile and hold my hand Yeah, pretty baby, I can understand Oh, I can tell, yeah, I can tell Oh, I know you don't love me no more Kid had this thing in his act where we'd do this guitar solo and he would throw a sword in the stage and it was great you know the drum used to catch the accent and you know it was pretty dramatic bit of uh, theatre and we were playing at the cavern on one lunchtime and the kids drawing the sabre out and he's, he's rattling it because he's rattling it around to catch the light and as he was doing it, I sort of looked down. Where the, the line had all worn away, it was concrete. The stage was concrete. So I'm going, no, no. And I'm, because I'm screaming at him, no. He thinks I'm, like, getting into it, so he's doing it more. You know, he's waving it around even more. Anyway, he threw the sword, and um, it hit the stage, bounced straight out into the audience. Some scal scallywag got hold of it and rushed out down Matthew Street with it. Well, he was original, you know. Um, original is always going to be ahead of its time because it's, no, there was nobody else doing that. It was a little bit um, dressy up here, but you know, we were the only sort of band doing it. As soon as he put the patch on, he was Johnny Kidd, right? As soon as he took the patch off, he was Fred Heath, muck him with the lads, up the local cath, played a pinball machine, all the local boys in here in Wilsdon. He was still Fred, didn't he? I used to crack into the back of a sort of Bedford van, the equipment in the back, and three seats. And he, always, he used to come with us. He had no problem at all. He was that sort of guy, you know, he wanted to muck in with a band. Hal Carter, today a top rock promoter, back then a roadie, remembers the ancient van, which only just got them around the country in the early 60s. Love me no more, he used to travel in his bloody old beat-up uh, uh, transit. And I mean, it, oh, God, you wouldn't go in it. I mean, you wouldn't, you'd rather walk. Doesn't matter how far it was, you'd rather walk. It was stinking in there. And, and they used to, used to travel all over the place and sleep in it and everything. They used to. It was just an absolute nightmare. I mean, it was always going wrong, it was breaking down. And he had thousands of pounds in his pocket. You know, he'd be on, on tour for a week. And he'd have all the money from, uh, from all the venues. I mean, he'd have a big wedge. I mean, he, he, if we were part of the passing a betting office, he'd, he'd be in there and 
bang 50 quid on a horse, you know, which in those days was a lot of money. Oh, yeah, it was terrible. Their biggest hit, I'll Never Get Over You, steadily climbed the chart, stopping just short of number one. That you told me you loved me so Then you went and said goodbye and found another guy I, 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 I. records in the charts and money in his pockets, he bought a large house in Harrow, not far from his roots. No, well, when he had that, the hit, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, you know, got the nice house and, um, and uh, you know, then it was lovely, yeah. We had holidays and it was nice. Mm. Didn't have any worries. Times were good for Johnny and Jean, and they celebrated the birth of their daughter by tying the knot. We got married at Caxton Hall, where everybody got married then. It was a pop star, didn't they? And, uh, and then we had a big party back at the house in the evening. Wedding guests included Tom Jones and the Hollies, but the good times didn't last long. Even with a new manager, the tour seemed as bad as in earlier days. I mean, we started getting some sort of stupid gigs. I mean, things that just didn't add up, you know, like a summer season in Blackpool with a dog act on before us. I'm not actually joking. There was like a poodle act on before us, and then we go, right, here we have Johnny Kidd and the Pirates, you know, and you come out. And it's like old age pensioners sitting. I've got nothing against old age pensioners, but I don't like playing for them. And uh, they were in the audience. It takes a whole lot you know, and that was a bit disheartening for like every duty rock and roll band, you know. I think the manager really hadn't got a clue what he was doing at the time. Management kept telling John to get rid of the pirates. You know, John showed me a letter where he, he said, you know, you should get rid of these, get another three geezers, you know, from anywhere, and pay them two bob a week each. And that was it. Well, we were getting four bob a week, but I mean... When she kissed me, I know she kissed me, I know... I... He should have written more songs. He had great, you know, great melodic ideas in his head. Because a lot of this stuff that we've recorded, when we used to do it live, he would sing it differently every time. But, um, couldn't be bothered. Johnny's casual attitude eventually split the pirates, and Mick Green went to work for Billy J. Kramer of Bad to Me and Trains and Boats and Planes fame. Johnny Kidd was disillusioned, depressed, out of the charts, and with no band, things couldn't really get any worse. People. No, we were in trouble then. He was just lying on the sofa all day long. And... I was doing everything, my parents were coming around and doing everything in the house and no, he was very, very depressed about it all, you know, it was, it must be very difficult for somebody that's been very high up to suddenly go quite so sort of low down, mustn't it? I had to do something fairly drastic actually because he was, he was kind of just giving up on everything and I actually just walked out. I was only gone for two weeks but he sorted himself out in that time because he knew it was serious. The jolt coincided with a knock on the door from a teenage bass player, Nick Simpa. Impressed by Johnny's live act, he suggested a new band. At the time we joined him, he was at an all-time low, and he decided the future was to drop the 
pirate act, get rid of the eye patch and go out and be a straight cabaret man. And that's what he intended to do. But we got to the first gig and we saw the posters up tonight, Johnny Kidd and the Pirates. And he turned around to Johnny Irving the road and he said, get the patch out, John. <laughs> Next thing he got the patch on, we got the gear on and he never stopped really. This young band got him working again, back on the road touring, often for very little money. But the tights, boots and the cutlass were being wielded again. October 1966, six months after he joined Kids Pirates, Nick and the boys went north for a few shows in Lancashire. With the chance of a few days holiday in the north of England, Jean also went along with their two-year-old daughter, Scylla. For the first time ever, um, Scylla was going to see him on stage. And um, so I went with him. We actually did go in the van that particular time, all of us. We had a Friday night gig. We had a Sunday night gig. For some reason, we didn't have a Saturday night. And the Friday night gig, we were late. Now, the guitarists had already arrived at about 5 o'clock. But the rest of us that travelled up in the van, we were late. We got there. We had a contract that said we had to be there for, say, 5.30. We didn't get it to about 6.30, 7 ish. It didn't matter because they'd only just opened the doors. There was nobody in the place because most people don't turn up till about 8 anyway. And the manager had uh, gone into his uh, sort of Hitler stance and said, That's it, you, you're in breach of contract, you're not on. So Johnny said, Well, look, you don't have to pay me anything. He said, If you give the guys in the band, there's only three of them, he said, give them a fiver each, we'll do the show. How's that? The guy wouldn't have it, you know, didn't want to know. Johnny now needed money to pay the band and the trip's expenses. They decided to drive to Blackpool to look for new gigs to pay their way. I decided not to go, which was very fortunate, as it turned out, and um, they'd gone out to, to try and get more work. One minute the guy's just driving us along the road and the next minute it's, the steering wouldn't respond. And uh, so consequently we went onto the wrong side of the road. And there happened to be a guy that just turned out onto the same road coming the other way. And of course he saw us on the wrong side, he just flashed his headlights and head on, bang, just like that. And that was the end of it. I think he was very underrated and, and he never ever got anything easily. I mean, even after he had shaken all over the next big hit when I was with him, um, it never really, really got plugged until it actually started to move in the charts and then everybody picked up on it. He, I don't think you could ever say he was a blue-eyed boy that really got pushed like some people did. I think he was underrated. Shake it, yeah, shake it.